Hello, folks. Welcome to a very special episode of Doom Mixtape. No, you did not uh, incorrectly <laughs> look at the amount of time that this video is taking. This uh, is, in fact, a two-hour video. And, I mean, recently I announced that I didn't want to do these videos anymore, so of course I needed to come back to a level that I was always intending to play. But I think what this series is is a testament to one person's ability to just ramble over footage of a video game for an extended period of time. And it's a test on whether you all will continue to watch it all the way through without it being edited. Um, so I think this should be the ultimate test here. And it feels only appropriate for one of the last videos that I do of this series to be that. So yeah, this is Map 23 uh, from the set Voyager by Bwin. I covered a previous map called Sedenium 3 way back in the beginning of 2020 before uh, the world uh, <laughs> went to shit. Well, I guess the, the world had already sort of gone to shit at that point. I, gu I guess it really depends on... Before the world went in full lockdown, we'll just say. Um, but yes, uh, this is... I mentioned in that video, I was like, uh, okay, this is probably my second favorite map from this set called Voyager. Um, and I said, uh, but I have one, uh, one other map that's my absolute favorite that I'll probably play later. That map is in fact, this one, it's called non Medol two. Um, so Voyager is this set, um, by B1, who I previously mentioned, um, B1 is a Russian doom mapper who worked on, uh, alt he did a few uh, of the maps for alts, like the two secret maps and map 22 or 23, which I covered in an earlier Doom mixtape. He also did Controlled System, the famous uh, last map of Sacrament. Um, but this is his one like solo megawad that he started doing presumably around the same time. The original thread... Uh, that was made for this was on the the forum iddqd.rru, which is Russian language, but through Google Translate, um, that thread was created like in August of 2013, and it seemed like he had been working on the set for a while at that point. So I imagine it dates back to around the same time, like Alt and. Um, uh, sacrament were being worked on if not like immediately after that so this was originally apparently going to be a russian doom community megawad but then became a solo project and if you didn't see my other video about this uh it was definitely true of the previous map and it's like triply <laughs> true of this map um this set uh, well, for one, it has not been finished uh, officially, although there are some updates in this uh, f uh, that I didn't realize that basically that the set is still being worked on. And I, I checked back on the forum thread and b had posts um, and at, um, updating and adding a few couple new levels um, that come from this year, like only, I don't know, three or four months ago. So, uh, yeah, that's very encouraging because I thought the set was never going to be finished. Um, but, yeah, the thing with the set is every single level is a freaking ordeal. <laughs> and um, it, I mean, like, the, the scale of the whole thing, even with, like, the version that I have, which I think the version that is still uploaded of the whole Megawad it was last updated in 2016, and I presume when I interviewed b for the article that I wrote about Alt, uh, the Doom Wad for Waypoint years ago, um, I think that article came out in early 2018, but I interviewed him in 2017, and, you know, it was kind of like a half conversation because we were both obviously using Google Translate. It wasn't like the same as, you know, when I interviewed Lanos and he actually had a translator. 
um, come and translate them, so I got much more extensive answers. Um, but yeah, this this set has never been officially announced. And the only reason I learned about it was because B when uh, made a thread, or because B when like mentioned that he had worked on this, and I mean, it says it in the um, in the thread that he made. But basically, I think it just amounts to the fact that like he just didn't really have the time or energy to ma to make a map of this scale. By the way, I finally learned my lesson on these videos that I turning up the brightness on this. So hopefully this video isn't like totally as dark and un, uh, you know, <laughs> unseeable uh, as other videos that I've done. Um, yeah, it seems like you should be able to uh, see <laughs> most of the level now. Because I, I, I notice like a lot of videos that I've done from this series have been too dark in one way or another. And I think it's because on my monitor, like I had the brightness jacked up. But anyway, um, yeah, I think he just didn't have time to work on this set. Um, so he was like kind of gradually updating and, uh, you know, posting updated versions. But that had basically stopped around 2016, 2017. Um, and, you know, he indicated that, you know, he probably would never finish this or he might not ever finish this. And because my impression was like because of when he posted it was in 2013 that this just hadn't been updated or worked on. But uh, that's not the case. Um, so even though this version only includes updates from up to like uh, 2016. I think this map dates back to 2013, or at least when he posted this on the thread, uh, he, he posted about this map in particular. So I will read what he said. I mean, obviously it's Google translated, so um, I'll just try to do my best to convey what he's saying. He said, uh, the case is moving. I assume that means that like the, um, like, there's a progress being made on this set. Uh, a number of improvements have been made uh, in previous published maps, taking into account uh, the uh, playtesting that were being done by other people on the forum. He said, many thanks to the work of, and then he says, the other people who have. So a lot of uh, the people who were sort of giving advice on this map set. Those are basically the only playthroughs of this set other than my one Doom mixtape map that exists on YouTube um, are from people in the Russian Doom community that were playing like initial versions of this set, as far as I can tell, and like offering him feedback. So, and that's because, you know, I learned that he had released this um, from interviewing him directly and never posted it on Doom World or anything like that. Um, and it's one of those things, like, I think I mentioned this on the, the previous video that I did. I'm like, okay, I'll check this out, you know. And <laughs> while it, over the course of, like, writing this piece, I played through as much of this set that was done, and it was such an ordeal. Like, it is like play playing a Bethesda game or something. It's like a triple-A sized experience. I mean, you just see from the length of this map alone, I have played this map before. Now, admittedly, I forgot how some of the pro progression worked, and this is one of the larger met maps in the set, but it's also like, <sighs> it's just map 23. It's like the second map of this set of like five maps <laughs> so i mean it's it's crazy uh it, just the scale of this by one person and when this does finally get released which i hope it finally does i mean it will truly be an achievement in the history of the doom community i really think i mean i know that there are a lot of people who have made very big doom wants but i don't think that there's something on this scale now i don't like this set as much as uh, Alt or maybe even Sacrament and there are some big reasons why I think <sighs> I mentioned this in the previous set and even like reading the um, the comments some uh, one or two of the comments on like the Russian Doom forum about it like <laughs> similar other 
other people were commenting similar things about the progression being very confusing and very cryptic, it being very difficult. There being a lot of places where you're just like expected to do strange things that you would never expect. And it does that on every single level. It's not just one level. It, it, it It's like, it's a part of the, the whole experience of playing this set. Now, some maps are more difficult than others. Some maps are longer than others. I think this is one of the longest and most difficult maps of the ones that I recall playing. Uh, but still, it's crazy. I, I do think it, it is one of those things, though, that, like, I remember when I first... When he first sent me this set, I was like, okay, I'll check it out. And I was just like warping around to different maps. Um, and this is the one that like immediately stood out as like, whoa. Cause like right from the outset, you can see the swamp area is just so stunning. Like the way that he had designed the trees over there. Um, and just like the weird, like t uh, moving electronic portal or barrier texture. By the way, this is a, a perfect example of what I was just talking about here. So I died because I'm pistol starting this on ultra violence. Um, and that might have not been the best idea, or at least I should have played through the map once before recording this. But it was such an ordeal to play through that I kind of just wanted to keep the, you know, integrity of this experience. Um... And, you know, it's certainly the case that all the other playthroughs that I've seen of these maps on YouTube by the other Russian Doomers are, have been around the same length as this. So it's not like it's um, significantly uh, unusual or, or overly long ex example of the experience of playing this. Um, but um, because of the fact that I pistol started this map and it's on ultra violence, like this beginning section is a little rough. This area right here, I somehow unlocked the door that opened up to the like main cargo sort of swamp area by doing some sort of series of move. I don't know what switch I hit. I should look at the map again. Um, to see what actually triggers that. But I feel like I kept doing the same thing that I had just done previously, but it, the door wasn't opening. So I'm starting to freak out and being like, oh no, am I just gonna need to start over like recording this video? And it seemed like it took forever, but it's one of those things like over the course of watching the video, I'm like, oh, this is like five or 10 minutes in the course of like a two hour and 15 minute video. So. Editing it down is like kind of pointless. I mean, it's just one of those things that like, even if I edit it down, I played it on, like even if I played it on Hurt Me Plenty, even if I like did another attempt of this level, I do think it still would have probably taken me like an hour and a half or something like that. So <laughs> in that case, it's like, I, I, I just rather, you know, include my whole playthrough here and you can see my struggle, but I get that it is like a huge commitment, not only to play, but uh, to watch. But if it seems like a huge commitment to watch this, uh, just imagine how hard, <laughs> how much of a commitment it is to play this entire set. So yeah, over the course of like 2017, when I had done this interview uh, about alt, I played through this set and I was just like, my mind was just blown by the scale of it. But it is one of those things that like, there are a lot of, highlights there are a lot of really nice moments to the set but it does like hit b wins design does have like it <laughs> there it hits like similar tropes it has similar like ideas that are reflected across a lot of them but um a lot of the levels that are more linear or have a less distinctive and and very particular sense of place aren't as interesting um just because and can feel more monotonous and more like it's just like constantly nickel and diming you it's like playing you know 80s computer games or early 90s computer games that just expect you to do this crazy combination of things in order to progress it has that kind of old school design sensibility but with like a scale of like a modern triple a game but I think the reason why this uh, 
this set or this level is the most interesting is you can really sort of tell from the outset like it's very moody and it's very open-ended um and he kind of commits to that more in this level than he does in a lot of other levels in the set i think that's what makes controlled system the last map of sacrament so good is it like starts linear but after a certain point it opens up and uh, the the overall like mood of the environment and like exploring it and kind of figuring out all the kind of facets of it um, and like kind of unraveling this puzzle, this puzzle box is really just like, it's like kind of a powerful experience that's hard to even put into words. And I think this level does that just as well, if not better. <laughs> I think the progression maybe is a little worse in this and the 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 swamp movement is like really part of the reason <laughs> why this playthrough takes so long is because moving through the swamps like slows you down so not only is that a problem just for like making the length of the playthrough longer but if you're like trying to dodge enemies um it makes you aware of how much the sort of fast movement in Doom is something that you rely on to get through situations. Um, and it just makes it that much harder to, you know, to deal with like huge hordes of enemies when you're wandering through stuff. Uh, so yeah, I've opened up the, the wall into this area. Let's read what B1 said now while I'm fighting these guys in the cargo containers. Yeah, I said, um, a number of uh, improvements have been made in previously published maps. It's time for the next swamp map. The case, uh, this takes place already in a, a certain reclamation, the station belonging to archaeologists who were engaged in the study of ancient temples in these very swamps. So non Madol, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, is a... Uh, an archae archaeological site that's like a historical landmark in Micronesia, in Micronesia, which is like this island um, off the in the Pacific, in a fairly remote place. I didn't actually know where Micronesia was when I was looking looking this up. I was like, what, where is that? Um, but it's kind of like the ruins of this ancient city, basically. That's what Non Madol is. Um, that have been kind of flooded. Um, and so, you know, the mood of this, of these maps, of these, this stretch of maps reflects that. Um, so yeah, uh, this is B1 again. And since it is difficult to dig in swamps, the necessary areas had to be drained. To collect the excess li liquid in the swamp and take it away through the pipes, uh, the the scientists had to do that. To their misfortune, scientists found portals in the form of small slabs, such uh, that were placed through the map that I guess was before this, uh, which of them uh, subsequently appeared. Uh, yeah, to to which some of them subsequently uh, appeared. The hero appears after evil spirits in one of these portals uh, stored in the shipping containers, which were just where I was fighting. Those were the shipping containers which the monsters were coming out of. Um, then he's, he's talking about the level. He said, the level gives you the freedom to choose the paths to the keys, as well as different lengths and difficulties uh, of the paths in their search. The map is large, so I advise you stock up on time for the game. Good luck. Yeah, so there you go. So there is like a narrative behind this. Now, of course, it's like a very Doom-like narrative. It's another reflection of the idea of this space that has been reclaimed by evil. I remember in when I interviewed him, he said, <laughs> he said uh, that the the kind of idea of the theme of Voyager is uh, exploring these different worlds that have been absorbed by mazes of evil <laughs> it just this like idea of uh we'll say malevolent architecture which i think is reflected in the original doom but i think really 
if if I had to uh to to make a summary of like what B B one style is, uh, I would say that's it. Um, but this is the kind of map like uh because it's more open ended, um, and because the the mood of the swamp is just so heavy, it's so like powerful, like it's one of those things that like. I had some very, um, when I played this, after I played this last night, I had some very, like, vivid dreams. And it is amazing, like, whenever I play something that is particularly an intense experience like this, it it's amazing how much it can affect you in ways that you don't even really know. Like, after, after playing through it, I, like, sighed, and it, it's like, I, like, gasped. It, it's like... I had a I had a bodily response to to play to this level and like everything that I just went through in this level and just the entirety of the experience. It's like watching a Tarkovsky movie or something like that. There's something deeply poetic and profound feeling about it, even though it is you're just playing an action game. Now, of course, like I mean, with Voyager, it's like it is very difficult and it doesn't have the kind of variation and generosity to the player that I think uh, Azimail's maps in alt do. I think it really demands much more of the player and it's not very generous in a lot of ways. Um, it's possible some of these things might be revised in like subsequent versions when this set actually finally gets put out. Um, but I have a feeling it'll still be pretty difficult regardless because that's just part of what it is. You can even see here, like, I don't think I have a rocket launcher yet um, or a plasma rifle. So just even taking on these guys, it's an open-ended space. I just have to wait for them to run over to me. And I just don't have a lot of room to, like, offer <laughs> room for error, basically, because they hit me once and I'm dead. Um, and, like, a lot of this, this map was like that, but especially this beginning section. I could have potentially, like, decided to go a different path, but I guess for me, like, the few times that I played this level, uh, this sort of felt like the canonical path to go this way. I could just wander off into the, the, the Great Abyss here, um, into these swamps, but um, there are actually a bunch of enemies hiding among the... the um, the overhanging trees there in that dark area that are very hard to see. So I don't really want to fight them in that area, especially when my movement is restricted. So I, I guess you can think of it as a, a move made by the designer in order to really discourage you from going to that area. Um, but I would say this beginning section, especially this like particular area that I'm about to enter in is probably my least favorite part of the map. Um, because it's just a little bit of a slog and kind of verges into slaughter map territory. Of course, if I were not pistol starting this uh, on ultraviolence, it'd probably be easier, but <laughs> I just decided to go with it because I played this map before. So, and you know, if you're gonna like, if you're gonna get the full experience of something this intense, if, I mean, if you're gonna play something this intense, you might as well get the full experience. So, yeah, um, I guess the other unfortunate thing about talking about any of these Russian Doom map sets or the fact that, like, I did a video about Azimail this past Christmas is, of course, there's, like, a bunch of horrible things happening in the world of geopolitical events. Um, obviously, Russia invaded Ukraine, and I don't know what that means for the dynamic of these communities or someone like Azimail in particular, because... Um, and there are a decent number of actual uh, game developers in Ukraine. Like I know the Stalker game that was the Stalker games uh, were uh, a Ukrainian company, and um, the sequel that was being worked on you know, is still being worked on in the midst of all this stuff. Um, and of course, this community, like you know, included. <laughs> uh, Russian and Ukrainian people, so that dynamic is extremely fraught now. Um, it is, like, weird to have, like, talked about this in the context of Doom and to, like, talked about these maps because 
And to talk about them in the context of something like almost geopolitical, like in the article that I wrote for Waypoint, like to talk about these Doom maps that are ostensibly not political in a political context because partly because of the stuff that's happened um, after and it adds like a weird uh, resonance to it or a weird strange eerie energy to it that's hard to convey I guess it's like I mean I, I was actually just watching um, or just listening to a podcast today uh, it's a podcast called Michael and Us where they were talking about Weimar era Germany art and how that like there were kind of like ghosts it, like how a lot of like great pieces of cinema obviously came from that era like Metropolis and uh, Cabinet of Dark Dr. Caligari and M etc um, but there were these traces or elements of what was to come in the world and especially in Germany um, like instilled in them and of course some of that becomes only apparent in hindsight but yeah it is weird that this any any art that is being made in either Ukraine or Russia um, has this inherent like political component to it now because there's no way for it to not <laughs> do that even if it's you know the most apolitical thing in the world seemingly which doom is generally something i'd consider pretty apolitical i wouldn't call doom some people might consider like doom reactionary i wouldn't say it is i wouldn't say it's like you know woke either it's just what it is <laughs> you know um yeah, I really don't like this area, so I'm going to take a while to get through it. I just don't really have the ammunition to deal with this amount of guys. I think the expectation might be that, like in a Sandy Peterson map, I should move somewhere else. But the problem is doing this unlocks a bunch of stuff. And I'm not sure... You hit so many switches over the course of this map that I'm not sure the importance of them, but I'm not going to like take for granted that I you know don't need to hit any of any of them so like i'm gonna hit as many of the fucking switches as possible because i don't want to be in a situation where i missed a switch in some area that i just was in and i can't progress and i have no idea what specific thing i missed so i try to make sh make sure to like cross my t's and dot my i's here which is kind of how you have to play this set because like if you don't hit the right switch or you don't notice the right detail uh you just won't progress in the level like there's it this th playing through this whole set like really trained me <laughs> to to do that um and even then you can see later on i'm gonna have an issue progressing because of something really stupid that i honestly hope be when when he does the final version i honestly hope he removes because it's something that is like so fucking easy to fix that like made the experience of this map uh, significantly more frustrating for me. But I figured it out eventually, and I figured it out without using a guide, which is good, because it would have been difficult to look up how to solve this map. Now, there might have been YouTube playthroughs in Russian that I could have, like, looked to figure it out, but it's, like, not easy to search for, so... And, I, and like, because it's not officially released, it's not always a given. I guess... The thing with Doom is you can, like, open up the maps in the editor, which I actually did, uh, to figure out, like, what happened in this one area that I'm going to progress to later. But, yeah. I don't know. Um, this map has just, like, lingered in my subconscious for so long, and there are areas of it that I kind of wasn't sure if they were part of the same map when I was playing through this again so like uh, playing through this map set again or playing through this map in particular again felt like rediscovering some part of my subconscious I think when you experience like something in art in general but like especially in a video game 
that there's a degree of intensity and it like encapsulates a lot of things. Um, your memories of it become free associative and sometimes things that are, you know, part of one thing just feel like they don't connect. And I feel like that actually is a great description of the impact that the original Doom had on me. Like, I mean, my favorite example of this is in um, episode two, map seven of Doom, um, spawning vats where it's like you you start out like th there's like a crate area at the beginning but then there's also like this sci-fi tech area but then there's also this hell area and they connect in this really strange way that doesn't make a lot of sense and feels like i mean it feels like dream logic and i think part of that is like that map in particular was like designed with a specific purpose that it then got repurposed but it is uh an example of like a larger dynamic in doom i think episode two of doom one in particular like evokes those feelings like uh map four of episode two and map two of episode two the the famous containment area um and so this is kind of a similar thing where it's like there's no like narrative that is explicitly assigned to this, these areas. Now, presumably like the designer had something in mind when they were designing it, but you kind of, that's all implied. You kind of have to figure that out. It was uh, honestly like really great to just even get that little snippet from b about the design of this level. Um, because I certainly didn't like hadn't read any of that stuff when I played through this whole set. It's something that <laughs> it's very weird when you play something that hasn't been officially released and it's this extensive and this just crazy. <laughs> like I I don't I, I I don't know. You I I you really can't take it for granted. It's like it's like pure heroin. It's like it's crazy. In all the in all the best and worst senses of the word, like it's it it was a painful experience to play through this set. Um, but it's also like after playing through it, I was like, I don't think any Doom map set will give me this feeling. I don't think anything I'm gonna play after this is ever gonna give me this feeling again. Um, and yeah, I still think Alt is the best balance of like approachability and um a, a bunch of evoking this feeling while also being approachable but yeah it's just crazy that this exists um i think i said in the other video that b1 has released um some other stuff in the ensuing years like wow this is still a work in progress like there's a set called relictum uh there's another um set that was based off of an idea that I actually originally started the Doom 2 in name only. The set that um, <sighs> I guess I originally started and then uh, I didn't really do anything with uh, I wasn't really in the mode to uh, be running something like that when I didn't have a lot of experience. Uh, and then it got taken over by newbies and then everyone on Doom World decided to shit on that set for being bad and I don't know. Maybe I should do a map from that just to like close the book on that. Uh, I don't really, you know, it got released and I still feel like there's some good maps in that. So I don't know what, I don't know. It just like, maybe that drama is long dead anyway. Um, but the Russian Doom community did their own version of it. Uh, and b did a few maps for that. I think I've talked about that already. Um, but yeah, I, I think one of the things is I've just not been playing as much Doom lately, and maybe part of the reason why is like, I don't know, once you experience something this intense, it, it, it is kind of hard to like, uh, it's just hard to have that expectation for something that is fan-made, that's free and non-commercial, um, and... Also, I have a gi gigantic Steam library, and <laughs> I want to, I want to play, get a chance to play a lot of things before I die. So, <laughs> um, not that I'm like 
Um, I mean, I, I don't, you know, who knows when they're going to die, but uh, yeah, I, I think I started to have a crisis about that. It's like, uh, I spent so much money, admittedly, like, on bundles and stuff of reduced price uh, that were, you know, not as expensive as buying games full price, but still, like, I want to play those things um, and not just play Doom once. <laughs> um, but I think in the early to mid 2000s, I was just in a very particular mindset that like, or early to mid 2010s rather, I was just in a very particular mindset that is kind of reflected by this series that I'm not really in anymore. But every time I come back to something like this or alt, it just reminds me of like the capability and possibility of this space to do something like that. And even I've talked about this already, but you know, when I played Dusk, uh, the game, uh, the New Blood game by David Szymanski and David Oshry and et cetera, et cetera, um, I started like looking into Quake maps and that community had its own like little explosion in the past, I don't know, several years and playing the community map sets of that was really fun too because it finally like got over my one misgiving about quake which is like stuff being like very monochromatic uh like a lot of the contemporary map sets are a lot more colorful and creative so i got really into that after that and it just reminded me of the the capability of these communities to like really do something cool that people won't do and oftentimes in commercial game development um it's just a it's an easy and quick way to explore ideas um but um yeah there's nothing easy and quick about about voyager <laughs> oh my god um all right so i finally made my way through that whole area i have no idea what these switches do don't ask me what they do i just know that i it's probably important that i hit them i think when i first played through this map i didn't like there there are these two doors that uh that have lifts that go up that send you up to this area but or these and and the switches that are kind of in a slightly hidden area that activate them and i completely missed them when i first played through this map so i was like okay I should be good now. I remember all this stuff <laughs> that all this stuff is in the level, but I missed one important thing, which is on the other side on that other door. Um, there is a uh, portal to a, an area that is extremely important uh, that I completely missed, but I did pick up the BFG. So that's cool. This is the area at the beginning of the map. I think like this map has like the best beginning of any map in Voyager because like, while you're not in like the main area of the map it like just the impact of being in the environment and like the the mood of everything is so intense and it really does a good job of conveying the feeling of this this map overall um but yeah if you do i i will put the download to voyager at least the version that i'm playing um there have been some maps that have been made after that just haven't been included in this uh particular uh version but um the one thing i say if you download the file it's like i don't know it's like 100 to 200 megabytes and that's mostly because of the music files like you can tell that this uses actual audio instead of like you know using midi or it uses, you know, MP3s or AUGs or whatever the hell it uses. I don't know what this is from. I know that um, B1's map in um, Sacrament uses this, like, ambient artist. Um, it's actually on the Doom Wiki, so you can find it if you look up Sacrament, the credits, but... I don't actually know what this is from, but it's probably from some, like, ambient artist, uh, I'd imagine. Ambient or, like, industrial artist, that kind of thing. But yeah, I think this, I think it just perfectly reflects the mood. I think it adds so much to the atmosphere of the set. It's kind of a shame that I was playing... I have this habit of, like, playing through Doom maps uh, with the sound off. 
so that I can listen to music or podcasts. I think that's kind of how I justified playing so much of Doom, but I really missed out on the experience of playing a lot of these maps. Um, okay, so here's a real big important area. So um, in that area with like the arch file and stuff, there are three teleporters that send you to three different key areas. Uh, and then, uh, which I obviously don't have access to, but they're on the end of one of the giant swamp areas. Um, and there's a little boat that you can approach, like if you're wandering through the swamp that's like lit. So that's the kind of, that's the, you know, the waypoint. That's like the, the important thing uh, that's happening in that environment. That's the landmark, uh, basically. And uh, that boat contains a teleporter. And it also contains one really important thing, which is the computer map, which you, I really helped me in being able to progress through this level because it helped me see that, like, okay, there are all these other areas. But you can see here, I don't want to fight these guys. Uh, if it looks dark here, it was equally as dark when I was playing through. So, like, I don't want to fight these guys here. So i just rather collect what I need to collect right now and get the hell out of there. And eventually, because I aggroed all those guys, they'll start moving back to the the area w with like the shipping containers uh, that was at the entrance to where all the swamp stuff was. But just the these this giant this giant uh, open area like underneath the swamp, like it has such a powerful effect. It's like it's so dreamlike. It's so I don't know. It's it's impossible to put into words and which is why, you know, we have <laughs> we have art to do to, you know, capture this experience for us. Um you can see I can move fast on these panels, uh, but they don't go the full length, so it doesn't help me that much. So this is the red key area, and this is the area that I probably struggled the most with because of one specific thing. I mean, it's already really difficult because I, I guess this is kind of like my second least favorite area um, because you have limited movement and I don't have like a lot of, of ammunition to be dealing with some of the, the level of monsters that I'm dealing with in this, this area. I do think I eventually pick up a chainsaw, which like really helps. Um, but like most of this is wading through sludge and dealing with enemies when you have limited movement is just a bad, a, a, just a bad recipe in doom. Like it's just not good. Um, so I, I guess in the, in the lore of this map, this is kind of what the science, this is like the, the draining, the pumps draining area that the scientist had. So it's the most, it's the area that's the most feels like you're like waiting in the muck uh, to, in this, like, half-completed science experiment. I would say, like, in general, uh, all of these B1 maps, like, especially Controlled System, has this too. They have this contrast between, like, this idea of, like, scientific, like, mechanic, mechanical stuff happening, like, this important scientific discovery like you're unlocking some system mixed with just a completely indecipherable alien world that um you don't really understand and is kind of a little disturbing and freaky um and i feel like his best maps really balance that really really well i'd almost call them like kubrickian or something it's such a cliche but uh, one of the sets, or one of the, the maps in this set, I think it's Aquatica 1. So uh, I didn't mention this before, but the the maps are uh, broken into like specifically themed areas. Um, and this is one of the later, one of the latest themes. Uh, this is the the uh, non-Madol theme. There's also, I think the last one is, is called Crematoria. It's more like hell themed the closest to like a conventional hell theme that you're gonna get. Um, but it starts off with Sedenium, which are the desert maps, which I think are aesthetically and maybe gameplay wise, um, some of the best and maybe most approachable, if you can call anything 
in the set approachable. Then you have Aquatica, which are like the aquatic ones. And the first map of Aquatica is, I'd say, one of the best maps of this set. But speaking of Kubrick, it, like, it contains um, a, a, like a shining, it feels like the shining hotel. It contains like a hedge maze that's so, sort of like the outside of the hotel at the shining. It feels like if it's not an intentional reference, it's at least like very evocative of it. Um, and I think it, it's honestly pretty fair to compare like Kubrick to <laughs> this guy, uh, V1 to Kubrick in terms of like, if there was a doom mapper that was, was like Kubrick, it would be this guy. Um, because I see some like shared sensibilities or ideas there. I mean, like classically 2001, a space odyssey is kind of about the, um, advancements in science and technology intersecting with this like unknowable mysterious uh totally incomprehensible and terrifying uh expanse of the universe um and i feel that way like playing through these maps uh, especially the best ones um but yeah after aquatica you have vexen these are like old castle levels i think the first one of those is my favorite um, it's either the first or second, I can't remember. Um, although map 15 of this set is, is pretty good. It's one of the best maps, I would say, which is appropriate. I feel like map 15 of Doom Megawads just like traditionally has to be a great map. Um, just because it's the one that contains the secret map and like, it's kind of, I don't know, like, I feel like map 15s are often way better than map, like, 30s or 29s or 28s. Because they often contain, like, the best balance of elements in a, in a given map set. Like, oftentimes, uh, you know, mappers and doom wads, they get a little too crazy with the combat, or the environments get a little too long and bloated after the map 15 mark. And, like, before, it's not, like fully developed enough like they they the levels tend to be not like they don't tend to have the same amount of development um so like the map 15 mark is usually like a great like midway point weirdly that's not really the case with alt like map 15 and alt is is great but it's really short but that's that's a pretty atypical example i'd say the map 15 and voyager is like a classic map 15 um and there's this weird and involved secret, the, a very strange secret map that, again, is another map that I considered potentially playing for this, but I decided against it. I honestly don't think I figured out how to beat the map. A lot of these uh, bring back, by the way, it, you can see while I'm chainsawing these, I think there's a nine inch nails symbol that appeal, appears in the blood splatter. <laughs> it's just so funny to me, like, I imagine like what it must be like as Trent Reznor to <laughs> like imagine if you're Trent Reznor being like oh I'm I'm gonna look back at the Doom community and play this and just like randomly you see in this random Russian Doom wad just like nine inch nail symbols everywhere I don't know I guess if you're famous you're used to that but yeah um but um. There's this bizarre secret level that is designed like the Sega Genesis game Zero Tolerance, which is kind of a Wolfenstein 3D style first person shooter. It's kind of a technical marvel and there's some cool textures in it, but there's a secret level that is heavily inspired by it. Apparently that game was popular in Russia, so it might be a, a, a reference to that. Um, but yeah, what I was gonna say is like, when I was a kid and I played Doom, there were levels that I... I, I was playing with cheat codes, mind you. Because the game was too hard for me and too scary. Um, there were um, levels that I couldn't beat because I, they involved some kind of series of puzzles or, or hitting switches. I think the most classic example I can think of is uh, uh, Limbo. Um, map seven of episode three, the one where, you know, 
it's basically a puzzle map, you know, it's like this forlorn space. It's one of the Tom Hall maps, like where you warp to different sections and you have to activate the switch to activate the platform. Now as an adult, I figured it out just fine. But as a kid, I literally thought the level was impossible. I, th I just thought it was impossible. And this wasn't too unusual for me because even playing Wolfenstein, you know, another, I had another example of that with episode four, map five of Wolfenstein, where there's a key and a secret which is a thing that infuriates me to this day, even though that map is fucking amazing. That's a, the, maybe the best map in Wolfenstein. Um, and I wrote a whole piece about it uh, years ago. But, um, but uh, yeah, I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out. So I just thought like, okay, they're just maps in these, these games that are impossible. You just, they're just impossible. Um, but, uh, of course, I had a friend who's like, no, they're not impossible. You can beat them. And I, it just, like, I just, it just didn't occur to me because that was just my, my sense of, of, of what a game was. Like, like, oh, yeah, sometimes they just have impossible levels you can't beat. Because I, I just, I, it didn't occur to me that there might be some way to beat it that I just didn't understand. Um, but, and, you know, as an adult, you don't have that experience anymore. Like, you know, everything is been demystified to some degree so playing through this <laughs> is, is the thing that brought me back to that feeling of like i just didn't know how to beat a lot of these maps i just had to like uh no clip or like look at the the maps in the editor to figure them out or like just warp to the next map there are at least a few maps in this set that were that way to me and like it is the case that like I assume if B1 is like releasing the map publicly at all, if he's posting it, that these maps are completable. But you don't know that for sure because this hasn't been officially released. So you are like actually on your own. Like there's no guarantee. Like maybe because this set hasn't been finished properly, maybe maybe this level actually just is impossible and there is no way to beat it. Um, and yeah, so like I, I couldn't figure out how to beat uh, that zero tolerance secret map and I couldn't figure out how to beat this one because there's just so much to it and a perfect example is in the area that I've just passed by that I'm about to come back to so this is a weird thing here this secret um, I was trying to get that megasphere the secret sends me out here um, but it's a one time thing so I can go back to the previous era uh, area that I was in and it won't send me um and it won't send me there, so, like, it'll just, I'll be able to walk over as normal. There are things like that, um, and I had to, like, I felt like I was being gaslit when I was playing the level, so I actually had to look at the map in the editor, and that was, in fact, the case. That's also how I figured out, uh, the big important other thing, which I'll come to in a second. Um... <laughs> oh my gosh, talking for this long is just gonna be exhausting. I'm not used to doing I mean I like I have a podcast and some of our episodes on this podcast uh, it's called Kitchfork it's about uh, indie music of the 2000s um, a lot of the episodes in this podcast are pretty long but the the difference is like even though I do a lot of talking like I do have a co-host and so I can take a break from talking uh, but it's impossible for me to do in one of these videos. So I just have to hope that my voice doesn't completely give out when I'm recording this. <laughs> I was like thinking about this. I was like, should I like edit this down? Uh, should I do something, you know, should I edit this down? Should I do something specific to make this easier? And I, I don't know. Okay. So here you see, I cannot go, I cannot go through there. I ran into a wall. Um, this so I was like, okay, this is blocked off. I can't go through there, right? I, I must need to unlock this area later somehow because this level is filled with switches that you hit. The, but much later, uh, I come back to this area and I'm able to progress. So I sort of figured, okay, I must have activated something in these other areas that allowed me to come back here and, and progress. But that is not true. Uh, what in fact is the case is... Um, when I ran down through there from the scent from like the, the very center, um, that area is blocked off by a, um, a rotating like dead body, like one of those, like 
guys that are on a stick, um, like impaled corpses on a stick. So if I go straight on, I'm not able to move through. But if I go to the side, I am. But there's nothing to indicate. Like it looks like it looks like a barrier. It looks like a barrier. It looks like something that you know. Like, okay, you need to do something that you haven't done yet. So I just assumed, I didn't think to, like, move to the right and move down through there. And then, of course, when I came back and I got stuck, and I'm like, okay, I need to get this fucking key in order to exit the level, um, I was just, like, started, you know, rubbing up against the wall, like, hitting everything, thinking, okay, I must have missed something. And then, of course, I walked immediately through (laughs) once I did that. Um, so, yeah, that is one thing. It's like, there's no reason for that impaled corpse guy to be there. Like, <laughs> that guy completely changed the way that I progressed through this map. Because uh, I would have gone to that area otherwise, and it probably would have saved me a decent amount of time playing through this map. But, yeah, here's the important boat. Like, if you look at this on an auto map, uh, on the auto map, it's a boat that can carry, uh, that uh, contains cargo um presumably related to the like theme of this map i'm sorry if i'm saying words like semi incoherently i said contaries instead of contains uh it's hard to talk like this uh for a really long period of time over a video and uh know what to say but as i was going to say before i think it's a true tribute to this series on doom mixtape like if I can't ramble over a vid- video footage of me playing through a Doom map for two hours, then I haven't achieved the true goal of this series. <laughs> so I, I've, I've proven to myself that I can do it for an hour and a half uh, on some of these videos. So, you know, I have, to, I, have to, I have to run through the gauntlet. I have to do it in order to prove that the series was, was worthwhile. It's just, it just feels like something that is... It's just part of the, the <laughs> things coming full circle. Oh, I guess I died, so I had to re-pick that up. Um, but yeah, I'm not picking up the armor right now because I have 170 armor. So you can see that it looks like a little boat on the on the auto, auto map. Um, and I'll explain the whole deal with the keys later, but obviously you need to pick up three keys for this level. And this is a level where you need to pick up all three keys. Don't think that in any of these Voyager maps, you don't need to pick up absolutely everything because boy, do you. Don't think that that you can just shortcut yourself through. You are not going to do that. So you can see there are three areas, three major areas that I haven't been to yet. One of them is this like ending area that I'm not able to access. One of them's the blue key area over there that's at the top of the map. Um, one of them is a far away area that I haven't been to at all, which is where I'm going to go next. And another one is the area that extends off of um, the swamp area or the like the the swamp pumps area where things were being drained. Um, that I couldn't figure out how to progress to. So uh, I'm just going to resolve to go to, uh, to, to, to walk the long trek to the, far, the farthest reaches of the level in order to play that section. Um, and that section in itself feels like the most, uh, feels like it could be its own level. But I think <laughs> it's funny to say like that I can be an hour in to playing a level, but uh, when I was uh, when I was recording this, that's the moment where I really started being like, okay, this map has really started clicking with me because I just felt so confused and lost in the first hour of this playthrough <laughs> about being like, okay, I guess I need to go here now. I don't know. It's so open and confusing. Um, but that area being relatively self-contained and like, at the end, yes, it does give you a key, which at least gives me something to do because that I, then I can come back and open one of the key areas and at least do that. It doesn't help me, like, you know, unlock the other key areas, but at least it's progress that can be made. Um, but, yeah, there's actually something, something very important that I missed earlier, early on in the level, that allows you to kind of shortcut walking this long trek, but... Um, I feel like it is 
kind of you're missing out if you're not walking this long trek because it is kind of the 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 highlight of the level it's like the full you you see the full like breadth and depth of like what voyager is just by <laughs> just by making this slow long trek through these like moody swamps in complete silence uh to this area where you have no idea what you're about to encounter it's just it's just very classic uh doom and voyager it's it's so it's so good um so yeah now i'm in this little underground maze uh that's gonna put me out to this other area um this area i'd say feels the most like the rest of the set it's more linear um it's still very difficult and contains a lot of weird things in it um but it's a little more concentrated like a series of challenges and it isn't so crazy and open-ended like this map is but i just to remind you this is not like a solo map in a map set this is map 23 <laughs> of a megawatt and while this might be one of the longest maps in the set it's <laughs> there are a lot of other maps that that are close so yeah, it, this isn't even like, this isn't, yeah, this is not even like a map 29 or whatever. This is like just somewhere to the middle towards the end of a map set. It's crazy. I can't imagine playing through all of this like in one really, con uh, and really like condensed chunk. It's like, it's such an intense experience. And a lot of it is similar to itself, I guess. Um, but then you have moments like this map which uh, obviously I think um, transcend uh, that. But yeah, so here we're at the, finally at the end of this, uh, this beginning part. Um, and yeah, so we have like comprehensible walls and like doors and uh, things are a bit more rectangular and there's still a lot of stuff that is like walled off here. A very classic B win. It feels a little bit like his map uh, Acid Jazz or something like that. You know, it's dense. There's all these like weird little details, like cracks in the floor, but it resembles a more conventional Doom level. It's not as like high density, high detailed, uh, not these like massive structures of some of the other a lot of the other moments in the set. Um, and I feel like, uh, I feel like that really actually helps in the context of this level because everything else is so intense and, uh, dense, um, that having a kind of its own like specific combat section that is like a little bit more self-contained, like, I don't know, it, it actually really works, uh, in this map set, even if it's like, it's not like as much of a, it doesn't wow you as much from like uh, a visual perspective. So yeah, these will do classic Doom map things of like, you know, being monster closets. Uh, this even feels like it could be an earlier map in Doom 2, like the, the fucking, um, what's it called? Uh, like the, the focus um yeah like the focus or something like that or the um why am i not remembering map three the the gauntlet the gantlet it feels a little bit like a map like that or the inmost dens or something there's like this um this outside area, it gives me an invulnerability so I can take down these barons who are, you know, really just meat sponges. It has, like, uh, random teleporters that teleport enemies around that are, I think, an attempt to track you. And then if you go down there, it basically, there's nothing down there uh, other than a teleporter back up. So, um, but, uh, and the soul sphere is just a secret that you can access later. I didn't get all the secrets in the map. I think I got like 66% of them, but I think that was a pretty decent job. I, for, for a map that is like, 
for a map set that is like so obscure at times, the secrets aren't really that much more obscure. So, and plus you're already like on the lookout for things just to in order to progress. Um, so, yeah, I loaded again there because I I didn't have a lot of health. I'm really trying to conserve health and ammo in this playthrough and not put myself in a potentially unwinnable situation because I don't want to get to a situation where there are tons of like revenants and arch files. Those are probably my biggest, uh, my biggest concerns because uh, revenants, it's like, so they move fast. It's they're so hard to dodge the fireballs, especially in open areas. And, um, Arch files are obviously extremely concerning. Pain ent elementals are also very concerning too, because they spawn those stupid fucking things everywhere. Um, but like an enemy like a Baron is uh, less concerning, but I at least have the ammunition to fight it. But um, I mean, you don't want them around because they can still do a lot of damage, but they're not like, they don't move as fast. They're more avoidable than um, something like a Revenant. Um, but yeah. So now there's another area that's going to open up shortly. I just need to, um, yeah, I was, l I'm, I'm going back to see if anything else opened up, but that stuff will open up later. I do have a BFG right now because I picked it up in a secret, so that'll come into play. Yeah, this actually feels like, this feels a little bit like, um, one of the Azimale maps in, I think it's map five in alt- um, I forget what it's called. There's like a train yard in it. Um, All Nightmare Long, maybe that's the name. Yeah, that's right. Okay. My brain hasn't totally decayed. <laughs> I've been really bad at remembering names for things um, in the last several years. Uh, I don't know if it's the coronavirus or being locked down or just getting older or depression <laughs> or what. Uh, but um, yeah, so it always makes me feel good whenever I can actually remember the name of something, especially when I haven't looked it up in forever. Yeah, this is another like, yeah, this feels like kind of like a Romero or... Um, Actually, an American McGee style thing uh, here. It's a little bit more of a conventional doom. Obviously, it's more detailed, but this is something that you would expect to find in in a doom wad, like an area like this. Which, for me, again, like when I've spent the first hour like wandering around and and worrying that I won't be able to progress and that I'll have to like redo recording this video is a huge relief to me because then I, I know what to expect. If if the level were just this, I would enjoy it significantly less, but the, the, the contrast of those things is really useful. Um, it really works well, which is, again, I, I think another one of the reasons why this is the best level of Voyager. Um, I didn't even finish saying uh, what the other themes are. That the one of the other map themes in Voyager, um, which in the version that I played, I think only two of the maps were actually done, um, are it says it, they're called like Charon, Charon or or Charon. Uh, they're like uh, they're they're set on the moon. They have this like very moody like, you know, it's kind of like Dark Side from Duke Nukem 3D, something like that. There's like a moon area at the end of that map. Something like that. It's very moody. It's pretty cool. Um, a lot of those maps are kind of mazy, though. Um, and I think he had only finished two of them. I, I think there are a couple in both this swamp, uh, non Medal three and four, and uh, Karan four that are the are the recent, the more recent ones that he's finished. Um, and then I presume he's finishing the Crematoria maps. Um, the other thing with Voyager is. Uh, no, I don't think every single map in the set is um, is actually finished. There are some that like take place on just the space station that are just like clones. It's kind of like Back to Saturn X Radio Report or something like that uh, in the in the Back to Saturn X set. Now that those could just be placeholders. Uh, you will see when I finish this map 
the next level is just like a gray box. There's nothing there. Um, but that map has been finished. Um, but it just hasn't been included in this set. Uh, like yet. You can download the individual map file. I'll actually put the downloads that I fished out of the, uh, the thread on iddqd.ru. Um, I'll put those in the description for this YouTube video too, if you want to play them. But just keep in mind that the set is being constantly updated, even still. Uh, so something might be changed. Um, it's sort of like, I, I guess No End in Sight is a map set that had like a, a really extended beta period before it actually got officially released. I think this is a more extreme example though. Okay, so this area is interesting. Um, I have a very long sort of pondersome uh, linear kind of, uh, you know, journey through these tunnels here that are spewing dirt. You're, you're kind of in the muck here. Uh, I'm trying to do my best to chainsaw these guys and not waste my ammo. Because uh, I, I, I do have a BFG right now, but I really don't want to waste the ammo for it. And I'm pretty low on ammo for a lot of things. Um, so whenever you see pinkies, you just got to chainsaw them. I, in the, in the um, uh, Google Translate... Uh, translates these enemies in this thread as being called uh, what are they called? I think a B1 called oh the pink biters. That might just be what they're called in Russian, but I, I thought that that was funny. The pink biters. Um. Yeah. I should also mention that this set is uh, a boom. Which I think is the it seems to be the favorite format of most Russian Doom wads, um, of this at least of this era. Um, uh, yeah, you can see I'm trapped in here now, and <laughs> this is actually a pretty effective Doom, uh, fucking uh, monster closet, uh, you know, moment I must say, because the moment that you see those walls to go go down and the. The, the moment that you see, like, those bars go up, you're like, oh, shit, something's about to happen. And then the, the way that the walls, like, very slowly come down, it's very nice. I, I thought this ambush was really well done. You can see more of the, like, cargo area. Yeah, I don't know. This just captures this, this feeling of, like, this ancient space that contains some, like, ancient evil in it uh, being excavated in, like, the half-hearted... Uh, attempts of scientists that are like you know not fully complete to uh, kind of excavate this environment I feel like there could be an implied like environmental critique to that as well uh, if you wanted to take it further uh, but yeah I just think that like even if there isn't like a any component of commentary on a you know, intended commentary on specific, like, I don't know, political or <laughs> socio-political issues, we'll say. Um, you can read into it with a map set like this because the imagery and the ideas behind it are so strong. Um, they have an effect on you that lingers. And there are a lot of different ways that you can sort of interpret that. And I, and I love doing that. Honestly, I kind of wish it was done more about video games. Now I, I don't like it when someone's like, okay, this is the definitive interpretation or this is definitely what the author intended or whatever. But, um, just the idea that, that doom maps can contain commentary about culture or society that is important and valuable that could, uh, you know, that could say something um, meaningful uh, in a way that, you know, it, it's the type of thing that could be considered artistically canon canonically important um, is really cool to me. I love the way that these guys come down out of here. This reminds me actually like this area is kind of like Half-Life 2 or something like that. Like the, the beginning sections of Half-Life 2 that are very linear, like the... I think when you're coming out of, um, I mean, the boat sections, obviously, but uh, also when you're coming out of um, Ravenholm, there's like a section where this, this guy like sniping you. 
Um, I think I was letting a cat out uh, when I paused there. Um, there's like a, a guy sniping you and there's a bunch of train cars and stuff like that. That specific little section feels the most like alt or like a lot of the Russian Doom wads to me. Uh, but yeah, I, I really don't have uh, the time or energy. Like, I'm, I'm probably going to die if I try to take on all of those guys with the chainsaw because they came at me from both sides. So that's where the, the BFG is extremely useful. That's why, you, that's why you hold on to your BFG ammo, folks, so you don't have to redo those encounters like 15 fucking times. You can see... Just the struggles of, like, even fighting an, an enemy like the Mancubus, like, I have to just, like, ducking around the corner. Because of the slower movement, everything is, like, a little bit more sketchy, and I have to be really careful. Um, but, yeah, now I'm at the other side of this, and, of course, I got killed by a uh, Hell Knight, but that's why we save off, and... Um... Yeah, and, and we're nearing the end of this section. It's going to sort of send me back to the area that I was at before. So that was kind of a nice diversion. I I guess you can almost think of this as like a AAA version of some of the things explored in an alt. Like, it's much more extensive. It's much more detailed. Uh, Gameplay-wise, maybe it's a, li a, a little less fun. Um, or sometimes it goes a little too far, but uh, it's also just the, the, the scope and the scale is like so impressive, especially when you consider this is done by one person. I don't know. I just, I consider like, I know there are a lot of like very ambitious games that were made by one person, you know, famously like Cave Story, Stardew Valley, Axiom Verge, whatever. There's like so many games that, that are like that. So I know that that's like, something that we take for granted uh, in this day and age. And I understand that like Doom modding, it's like you don't have to make the system. You're just you're just importing textures and and making levels within it. But still I I like when this set is finally finished and released, it is truly an achievement that I think cannot be um, discounted. A tr truly like a I consider it like one of the wonders of the world or something. It's definitely like one of the wonders of doom mapping that just someone would do this. And like, I don't say that lightly at all because I played a lot of doom maps and there are a lot of doom sets that are very long and very ambitious, including ones by single map designers, but there is nothing like this. Um, Cause even like the, like nearly every map in Voyager could be its own, it could be a single map set and people would be happy with it. People would be happy if it were just like a one or two map map set. It would still be considered probably a classic uh, if you, I mean, by certain people. I mean, I think some people will never probably get used to the very specific style of like game design this has, the fact that it really does nickel and dime you. <laughs> The fact that it is a lot more taxing uh, and requires like, not just like, it's not just like that it's slaughter mappy or difficult, but it requires navigating difficult, complex, hard to suss out environments in addition to often having difficult combat and often having like a reasonably limited number of resources. So um, I, I don't think, I can't imagine that it's something that won't be divisive but for the people who love it like whenever this does get officially released i do think it's a really important it'll be a really important set um yeah i actually like that he replaced the uh that he replaced the the like um former humans with like doom marine sprites it's kind of cool so finally, uh, one almost one hour and 20 minute into the set, we picked up our first key. <laughs> now some of that is like me missing fairly obvious things, or I shouldn't say fairly obvious things. Me missing things that were like right in front of me that I didn't understand how to progress in. 
so I'll pick up the other keys are not actually as hard to get as you would expect given how long this key took to get but um yeah it's still like a crazy feeling to be recording and see oh, oh shit I've only gotten the first key of this map uh and I'm an hour and 20 minutes into playing it um yeah so now I just have to go back unfortunately um, there are some health pickups that I missed, but only like small ones. Those like oil drums hurt you too. It's just like another way in which this is like, you know, it's hostile architecture. That's all I can say. Every bit is kind of designed to not feel friendly. I was not ready for that Cacodemon at all. I was just expecting this to be barren. Uh, so now we got to be really fucking careful here because it doesn't seem like much, but there's an arch file right coming down there. And boy, have I got to kill this thing as fast as possible because there's no chance for cover. Um, so yeah, this is one of the scariest sights that you can see in Doom when you have 17% health because this guy is going to fucking kill you. There's no, there's no way to avoid him, especially when you're moving as slow as you are here. So what I just do is run back here and hug the wall. There are multiple parts of this map where I've had to do that and then take him out. And boy, does that feel satisfying because the last thing I want is for that guy to be roaming around this map. Uh, it's really dangerous. I don't know. It's so scary to see uh, to see an arch file like running through a map with a lot of dead enemies that's huge where you have limited movement and there's no fucking cover in sight so yeah now I'm making the long trek back now you will see shortly well probably not probably in like a half an hour that there's actually a shortcut uh, to get to some of these specific areas um, but I don't know. I didn't know about it, and also it's it's just at this point because I don't have monsters following me around everywhere because I killed a lot of the monsters that were in this area. Um, it's just fun to make the slow trek. Um, but yeah. Uh, so now because I have the yellow key and I don't know what else to do right at this moment, I'm just gonna go to the yellow key area here. Um, now we're going to come up... I, I wouldn't say this is my least favorite section of the map because it's not like, you know, compared to everything else, it's not that difficult. It's the most, like, doomy. You know, it's the most like a slaughter map of any uh, aspects of these maps. But I would say that this... These key areas, uh, if you don't include the very last area of the map, which is good, these, like, key areas are probably the weakest part of the map because this is, like... You know, this is a, a nice, like, tense combat situation, but it, it's not really interesting from a perspective of, like, what we've seen before. Like, it's it's just a giant open, like, crate, crate mazy cargo area with a lot of enemies everywhere. In the context of this map, it's not a big deal because it, um, we haven't seen, uh, and we haven't had encounters specifically like this. Like, the other intense combat encounters have been in fairly closed spaces so having it in a wide open space actually feels like a huge relief here and that's what makes it uh easier uh even with the density of monsters and the fact that you will see that there's a couple cyber demons around here um and yeah i i'm not good at fighting cyber demons i don't know how people two shot them with the bfg that is like so hard to me i've never been able to do that so it'll take me a while to kill them, but even still, like, you know, you get you get through it way faster given the intensity of of the combat than like um you know, the area at the beginning of the map where I was in an enclosed space and like the door shut behind me and locks and I just have to run around and hope these monsters fight each other and I have very little space to dodge anyone. There's so much opportunity for cover here that it, it makes it a lot easier. So I guess this teleport just teleports me back to that area, um, which I can just walk through this teleport again to teleport me back here. So I guess it's just there for convenience. 
it doesn't really like it's not really that significant of a shortcut because I could just go back um, to the boat area and teleport back but whatever I guess it's nice to have uh, yeah I have 1% health right now uh, I, I I was not following the, the credo of uh, um, <laughs> Doom World Legend uh, Alfonso. I was not 1% uh, saving the game there. You gotta save it at 5% here. Um, but yeah. You don't wanna, you don't wanna be, <laughs> you don't wanna be down this low when there are hit scanners in a map. You just don't. When you're fighting a fucking cyber demon, it doesn't really matter because he's probably going to kill you anyway. Unless, like, if you have 200% health, maybe not, but... Like, if <laughs> it, what does it matter if you have 1% versus, like, I don't know, 70 or 80% against a cyber demon? But you certainly don't want hit scanners in your midst. Yeah, I, I'd say this is the most, like, conventional Doom community kind of uh, combat. Which, again, in the context of this map, is fine because um, we haven't really seen anything like this. But in the context of, like, <laughs> a map 23 and just a, a just one of many maps in a larger set, it's, it's a lot. It's just, like... So many Doom map sets have this problem. Uh, a rel not exactly the problem that this map set has. Nothing has the problem that this map set has. But, like, the problem in terms of, like, every map has to just constantly ramp it up in terms of enemy encounters. So by the time you get to the end, it's just, like, intense wave after intense wave. And it starts to almost get... It's just, like, shoveling through huge piles of enemies... It starts to get really tedious to me. I've just never really enjoyed it. I don't know how people get through. And that's why I tend to not like later levels in a lot of community megawads because they tend to do that. They tend it, it tends to be like, okay, after you get to like the last episode, you know, after you get to like map 20 or 21, it really starts to like just be like that every single map and it becomes really frustrating to me. Um so I'm kind of happy to play this for its own video. And if you really feel like taking the plunge and playing this map set, by all means, but uh, yeah, uh, you're in for it. And maybe you should wait until it's finished anyway. Who knows when that will be, though. This could take another five years for all I know. So yeah, we don't just have one cyber demon. Of course, we have to fight two cyber demons. I will say this uh, key area, which is the yellow key area, like uh, I like it more than the blue key area, which is a similar like boss encounter. It's except with uh, spider masterminds. Of course, spider masterminds are easier to kill, but it doesn't go as fast because it's like a lot. It's more like enclosed spaces and hitting switches, whereas this is at least playing into the strengths of Doom Combat, of being this, you know, wide open space that you run around in and pick up, you know, just like slurp up uh, items. And I mean, that's the reason why there are so many Doom map sets that are designed like this, that give you freedom of movement, a bunch of ammo and a bunch of enemies, because it is inherently fun. Uh, and it is something that is like, you know, Doom is good at doing. So I don't want to like, you know, discount that. I don't want to say it's a bad thing. Especially, I think, at this point, like, I, I understand. I, I think, like, when I originally started this series, I felt like there were there was a lot of, like, reductionism about the idea that that was the, the way that Doom maps should be designed or, like, the Doom maps were just inherently designed towards specific, like, combat encounters and specific... Um, uh, theory of of the design like where the spaces may be abstract uh, there's intense enemy encounters etc even if they're not like slaughter mappy they they have to be focused on the combat in a very specific way um, 
and I felt like I saw a lot of stuff that was like contradicted that. And so, you know, it was important for me to like point that out because I also felt like, um, that's just kind of a random secret to find. Um, because I also felt like, um, that kind of design reductionism was happening a lot in like the indie game space too. And just like game, the games world in general, I, I guess it was just a very like early to mid 2010s thing. Um, but towards the end of the last decade that kind of started to die down. And I think people like canonically, uh, recognize alt and, you know, some other things like that as being important. And there, there isn't like the same, <laughs> there isn't like the same overarching, um, dominant strain. Um, if anything, the, <laughs> the strain that exists is just people putting like fucking custom, <laughs> custom textures and like kind of making a boomer shooter light i guess is kind of <laughs> what this the dominant strain is now um i'm not saying that and like because like stuff like adventures of square or whatever pre really predates boomer shooters anyway as as like a label so uh and there's plenty of stuff in the doom modding community that's that case uh this you know that's like that too so um i don't say that in a you know, uh, demeaning or, or uh, you know, derisive way at all. But, um, but yeah, it, it does mean that the, it's just like, it's a lot more work. Um, and I feel like, uh, I, I guess there's also this specific interest in like retro stuff of a specific type. Like, um, you know, back in like the early 2000s or uh, 2010s, I would hear a lot of people talk about how like PlayStation one and N64 games were so dated and like that design and presentation style was so dated, didn't age well. And like tank controls were terrible and all that kind of stuff. And I remember being just kind of annoyed by that because it felt like so reductive. Um, yeah, I need the red key. So I still need two more keys. Uh, I'll get them quicker than you think, but yeah. But um, there's just like, guy that I didn't even notice there. That guy survived a lot. He, he was coming for me. He's like, he, he, he really waded through the shit. He like, he saw everyone around him get slaughtered and he's like, no, I'm going to be the one to take him out. <laughs> oh man. You know, props, props to that guy. Um, but yeah. Anyway, like at the time there were a lot of people being very dismissive about like you know early 3d games and i always got kind of annoyed by that um because i felt like it was very reductive but now like that as like a retro sensibility has become so popular that it's just like even like i was playing this game signalis which is a really cool game generally um it has a really cool aesthetic it's like a horror indie horror game um, and the aesthetic is very unique, but it is basically Resident Evil, like, and I mean, I, I like Resident Evil 1, even though there are elements of it that are very frustrating, so that's fine with me, I mean, that's good, I think they do a good job of it for what it is, but, like, those things were not necessarily, uh, uh like, uh, just elements of those original games are being echoed so faithfully in this like nostalgia way. And I see it a lot with like the haunted PS one stuff. And I see it to some extent with like the boomer shooters too. Like there are some that are just like, so indebted to specific games and specific, uh, genres like that. It just reminds me of the same kind of process that like, you know, pixel platformers went through where it's like, okay, I get that you like Mega Man and Contra, you know, and fucking Castlevania. Let's do something different here. I sort of feel that way about a lot of these games too that are like, you know, doing the like early 3D PS1 and 64 style. It kind of like, for me, like what, what was interesting about that stuff is it's like the sense of novelty to it because... 3D was so novel, like when it first came about, that people didn't quite know how to d what to do with it. 
So there is this kind of idea of like, a lot of spaces are very abstract and dreamlike too. So there is this sense that like, this could be anything and you're kind of still figuring it out. And I, I like that aspect to it. But when it just becomes a set of like tropes that, you know, people are following, like some indie horror games that are just like making a lo-fi version of Silent Hill or Resident Evil or whatever, it's just, uh, it's difficult. Yeah, once again, I went straight on here uh, and did not go to the side and realize that I could progress there. It's so annoying to watch, but then again, why the fuck did you put that guy on a stake there who like blocks my way? Like there's no reason to do that. It just <laughs> makes things uh, unnecessarily fucking complicated for no reason. You can see this area isn't on the auto map. You can hear an arch file here, but I never end up fighting that arch file. So unless he comes up in a different area, kind of weird. Uh, whenever there's an area that's like not on the auto map, uh, like I feel like a lot of the Russian sets do that a lot. Like I, I know the, um, once again, <laughs> I even like moved to the side a little bit there and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't get through it. Um, and I can even see up there, like, okay, I'm going to need to go to this area because there's like a, by the way, that's an effect that is like a boom specific effect, like translucent walls. You can see the translucent effect being done on the blood, on the, the mud falls. And you can see it being done there with like the, the glass view into that room, um, which is cool. Uh, there are uh, other specific boom effects, like, you know, when that, when those, um, uh, when the demons were released from that, like, um, when I was walking down the mud tunnels, there's another area that, that is going to have, like, a conveyor belt that, like, spits me out at the end of this, this whole area, um, that is also a very specific boom thing. So I feel like, uh, these sets use it well. Like, I feel like, uh, Voyager uses the boom features well, and it makes it feel like even though boom features, like, there's some interesting ones, but it, they're not that extensive. Um, it still makes it feel pretty significantly different, though. Um, but yeah. Uh, I'm just treading ground that I've already tread here. This is where I start to get very confused. Um, but I make one important discovery uh, shortly, probably within the next 10 minutes of this playthrough. Um, and that's that I missed something very important, uh, back near the beginning of the level, uh, which it, you can't really tell from just looking at the auto map. Uh, it's actually just seeing, uh, you know, an alternate entrance into one of the areas. I think the worst part of this is like, um, if you're trying to go back to a previous area, you have to just wade through the mud and it takes forever. It's not like a normal Doom. This map doesn't, see, like when you look at this map on the auto map, it doesn't seem that big, but it feels so massive to play. I think part of that is the fact that you move through so slowly through the mud, but part of that is just that like, if you zoom out on any Doom map, it doesn't look as big. <laughs> uh as it actually is. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna eventually wander back to, um, to the area towards the beginning of the map. Um, and that's gonna, that's gonna give me the key forward. Cause I think I remembered while doing this Oh, that blue key that's like locked at the beginning. Like, I've obviously I'm gonna need to pick that up. There must be some other way to get that. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm headed now. Um, but yeah, I was talking about like, yeah, I, I think my frustration with like, yeah, so this is the blue key area. I can't get to this right now. You can see that there's like something I need to shoot there, but I, I can't reach it right now. Uh, a lot of those Russian maps have like tiny switches that you have to shoot. 
Um, it kind of goes with this feeling of like, you know, malevolent architecture, like you're, I don't know, like we talked about. But um, the big the big thing is there's an area in here that I need to access, uh, that teleporter. Um, I That room, this, that room just serves no purpose. This teleporter is very, very important. And I completely forgot about it because it's like at the beginning of the map. And, you know, when you see that and it's locked off, you're like, okay, uh, obviously there's some other way to get to this. Um, so you assume that like, oh, maybe at the very end of the map, I'll be warped back here, right? Maybe it's doing one of those things. But no, that's not really the case. I need to find, I just need to get on the other side of this building on the outside and enter from the other side, which is what I just realized looking at the map here of this playthrough. So I'm like, okay, fuck, I need to do that. How am I going to do that? Um, God, <laughs> Th these fucking lifts uh, really capture uh, playing through a B-Win level, like of having two different switches and you have to hit a switch under another lift in order to like activate the door that you need to and the door is timed. It's like every just little thing. It's just like things upon things upon things. Um, but yeah, I need to get up to this this area here where I'm looking up. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that right now. Um, and eventually I'll go back to an area that I was previously where I missed something really, really stupid. Um, and that's the danger of playing through any level like this is like if you don't walk through one teleporter, <laughs> you could just be totally stuck, you know, in some area where because there's a few different places that you can go, you're like, okay, you either don't see something or you, you'll be like, okay, I'll come back here later. Um, and then you just completely forget about it because you've done all these other things since then. And then you have to wander all the way back and just go through every corner. So yeah, right there, it looks like there should be a teleporter. That's not, but on the other side, there is... And boy, is that teleporter really important. You need to step through that teleporter to beat the map. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So you can see these switches that are like hidden in these alcoves. Here. It's easy to miss that. It's fucking crushing ceiling. And I, when I was playing through this, <laughs> this level, like when I was first going, yeah, this teleporter right here. So this is what puts me on the other side of that switch in that room. So I can finally hit the switches that I need. Uh, and there's some ammo here too, which is like, I guess it's expecting that you're gonna come here pretty early on level, which is why it gives you a, a super shotgun. But I'm like towards the end of my playthrough of the level. So I hate fighting tons of revenants in like a tiny area. It's such a fucking, it's such bullshit. And of course I didn't save, so I'm gonna have to run all the way back there. Um, but yeah, what I, what I was gonna say about N64 and PS1 games is like, like what those games represent to me is like an exploration of novelty or new game. It, it, like, it opens you up to a different way of thinking about game design. I think that's the most important thing to me. But when it becomes just another like, okay, we're just gonna copy the canonical entries because those are the ones that everyone have played. And I, I don't think people are doing that, you know, with that intention necessarily. They just, it's what they're most familiar with and like and all that kind of stuff. Um, it just like creates this thing of like nostalgia for the sake of nostalgia, which is like my big issue with like some of the indie plat, like I think Shovel Knight is a good example of like, I, I just don't really like that game. A lot of people really like that game, but it just feels too Mega Man to me. And I don't really like Mega Man. And it feels like a little, like this kind of like indie retro twee thing that is not really my thing. There are so many Metroidvania fucking uh, games out there that either feel like Castlevania or Metroid 2 that are still being made to this day. And it's just like, do something different, you know? And so I guess my, my slight despair that I feel about like the haunted PS1 type stuff is when people are just making the same 
they're just doing the same design tricks that those games did fucking 25 years ago. And they might be adding a new visual sensibility. They might be like more fricked up and weird or something, but they're not really like, they're not really doing much to like, you know, be in dialogue with that and like add stuff to that. And I, I, you know, I've complained about that with boomer shooters, but it's just true in general of a lot of like things that are overly indebted to like retro games. That's what I find so frustrating though, because it's like, when you say overly indebted to the design and retro, it like, when you like take inspiration from something, I always view it as like, as like, okay, this different way of approaching things opens me up to a different way of thinking about approaching like my own ideas. And maybe I'll borrow some ideas from this thing, but I'm not gonna make a straight clone. But so many of these things really are just straight clones. Um, and like, maybe that's fine. Maybe it's people like reverse engineering how those games work and trying to make their own version, which is fine, but it's like, <laughs> I don't know. I also am way less interested in playing that. Um, and it, it just like the whole, as somebody who like, you know, that whole N64 and PS1 era was probably the, the most consequential moment of like me being engaged with video games. Cause you know, the classic cliche, I was like 12 years old. <laughs> I was like between 10 and we'll say like 14 years old when that era was going on. So of course it was going to make the biggest impact on me. Um, it's just not how I thought that like nostalgia for that stuff was going to go. I thought it would be different. And I don't know. It just kind of bums me out when you see that, like, I mean, there's cool stuff that people have made, but when you see like the limitations of that where it's just like become about a specific aesthetic and copying specific ideas in game that games have already commercial games from 25 years ago have already done uh and it's often done better um so i don't know just bums me out um but i i guess that's the the one that's like my reflection of uh, how things have changed since I started doing these Doom mixtape videos of like there being a very specific design ideology that was very dominant. I finally get to pick up this fucking Megasphere at the beginning. But yeah, you can see that that portal is what I was finally able to access to finally get the blue key, which is just right at the beginning there. It's not actually that hard to get that blue key. I mean, I did need to go through the whole gauntlet of guys that I went through earlier, but once I have access to this, like it shortcuts you to other places. So I could have really used this. This is also like a common feature with a lot of B1 maps where they, they have teleporters that shortcut you to specific places, but it's something that is done in the original Doom. Obviously, like I talked about it, I think in my Doom 2 videos I did a while ago, the Citadel has this. Um, teleporter that sends you to different corners of the map. So these are obviously color coded with specific areas. So like the yellow teleporter sends you right in front of the area that where you eventually pick up the yellow key. The red one sends you to this mud area. So that tells me that, okay, yeah, this is where you pick up the red key. Um, so I know now I'm like, okay, well I need to figure out how to fucking get this key. Cause there's, there's like nothing else I can do other than, um, I guess go to the blue key area. Maybe I do do that first. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. Like the number of times that I wander through this area and like, I should be able to progress. Nope. It's cause there's a fucking guy just like right there. If I just move to the left or the right a little bit, but no, I'm not going to discover it <laughs> here. Oh, uh, it's so frustrating. Just like no reason to put that enemy in that specific place in this level. So yeah, now I'm just gonna go to the blue key area that needs to be opened up um, and go through that area. That's probably my least favorite of the like uh, 
you know, key areas because it's just like a bunch of uh, spider masterminds in a box. You know, it's not that interesting. Um, but yeah, the, like, you know, when I, I, I've said this many times, when I started this, these do mix tape videos, um, I felt like there was a particular type of design, uh, kind of, uh, design language, design ideology that was very present that was kind of being spouted by people in an unexamined way. And things like level design for individual levels, like, were becoming sublimated to, like, roguelites and and other ideas. Like, it's things that are randomly generated. Like, thing, ideas that are very, like, top-down in their approach. Um, and roguelites are still all over the place in games, especially, like, deck builders these days. But, um... But, like, the, the idea... And, you know, for me, like, I always having played Doom mods and Wolfenstein and, you know, even Mario games, the way that I think about uh, games is very much mediated through level design. So to me, that was like alienating. So that's part of the reason why I started doing this to theoretically reach an audience of people that might've been following my work from like the indie game world and would care about these like niche doom maps because of how they reflected a different approach. Um, I am like, unfortunately like so out of touch with that world. I mean, it's like, I still know a lot of those people, but like, I'm like not part of the conversation. I'm not really sure that I ever really was. Um, I don't feel like my stuff was like taken that seriously outside of a handful of people. Um, and maybe it's because I didn't have like specific institutional backing or like or just a random person, you know, writing on the blog and doing YouTube videos. I think the idea was not to like become a, a big thing per se, but just to become an example of like something else, like to be influential rather than like, uh, you know, real big. Um, but I think, as, as with most things that I've done, like most of the audience that it reaches are just random other people who are kind of, uh, who either follow this stuff or are just kind of random outsiders uh, who don't really have a, uh, a window into that kind of stuff. And the sort of career people who are discoursing about these things don't really watch these videos, presumably, because I think a lot of them are just like, not spending a lot of their time engaging with content in general, but especially after a certain point in time, like, um, like that whole conversation became very fractured and a lot of people just don't like each other, uh, but, uh, don't say it out loud. So there's this kind of like fear of expressing how you really feel and stepping on toes so you never really get the honest opinion of people. And just the combination of people like being busy and not really engaging with stuff and there not being like a lot of social reward for doing so, I guess, is part of why like, you know, I just felt like whatever I was doing, you know, wasn't really part of any conversation anymore. I wasn't gonna like, <laughs> I wasn't going to have somebody with like, you know, I wasn't going to have Robert Yang, who is somebody I know and like respect and have done music for. I wasn't going to have him like look at my videos and be like, oh God, Liz, you're right. Uh, my approach was wrong. <laughs> um, that was never going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. I, I I I guess the the flip side of it though is that it ended up reaching another group of people and I think still has its own value but I think outside of like the utility in that specific scene I didn't even really think people in the doom modding scene would would watch these videos either that's the thing because I'm like 
even though I follow the scene, I'm like not like a super active member. And I thought that they just inherently wouldn't agree with what I said with what I said anyway. Of course, I think probably way more people who follow Doom modding watch this than people who don't. Um and that like uh that uh establishment that I perceived existing in my head like uh if it did exist uh was not as uh predominant probably as i thought it was but um it did make me kind of feel like well what's the point like i'm not reaching the, like the whole reason for starting this was to like be like this alternative discourse on design and level design and to present these like esoteric things that were different and like from outsiders and stuff specifically with the idea that it would like you know s help sway some people who would not normally engage with this kind of work that there's there's something of value here um and i think you know i think most people would oh i okay this is the one part of this whole section that i do like i think this was a good oh a well done ambush here because i really didn't expect it to happen and it's also like we're getting to the end of the map depending on you know what order you're playing things in and Generally, this whole section has been very straightforward, and it's also just kind of a, a huge scrum where monsters are infighting with each other, and there's a lot of open space. So I think this ambush was actually pretty well done, because it's not like one of those things that it happens in a space where it was like really obvious that it was going to happen. I, I really didn't expect this to happen. It was just right when I went over to pick up some ammo boxes and hit some switches, all of a sudden all these monsters appeared. So... I think this is a good ambush. Um, so good job, B1. But yeah, I thought... I don't know. I like I, With any of these things, I don't know what I expected. Because so much of stuff that I've done is... <laughs> like... It has been done with the idea that I would like... Because that I would like have the ear of some like institutional person. And I would like sway them to to see uh the value in something that they haven't um and i think what i've realized is that people are tend to be predisposed towards certain things and and people can be swayed but if they're swayed it's like very gradually um because so much of the internet today is people doubling down on the things that they already believed in an ex increasingly aggressive and concerning way <laughs> Um, and I guess, I guess that can be good because in my case, I feel like I've come around to, you know, understanding why I believe in the things that I do. Um, but it also means that like, it feels like you're making something for nobody because you're trying to convince this like theoretical person uh, that is like somebody that you might have met at some point that's probably not going to engage with your videos because they're busy or uh, because they don't take it seriously or, you know, any number of reasons. Um, but you're also talking in this way that is like directed theoretically towards this person or a perceived establishment that somebody like who's watching these videos isn't necessarily going to have context for her. So <laughs> it does feel like, uh, okay, just talking to no one here. So what was the point of this? Like, what was the point of like, uh, making myself vulnerable in this like performative way online every w w when it's like, it just seems like a silly idea. And like, once that like original context got lost, it sort of felt like there was no point in doing the series anymore, which is part of the reason I stopped. I guess the other part of the reason is I just didn't feel like I had substantial other things to talk about. Like I was really trying to focus on very specific maps that I liked. Um, but then when I brought it back, it's because I, I just kind of was like, okay, what the hell else am I going to do? <laughs> um, you know, and I didn't take it as seriously as the original, like, Doom mixtape videos. But as a result, like, 
I feel like there's a there's like an intensity missing to it, which was kind of the original point of doing this whole <laughs> series. It kind of you know outlived its usefulness years ago, and so it's just kind of become this thing, this like ritual that I do because I have a Patreon, and you know if people are paying me money, I might as well be doing something with it. Um. But also, I think the expectations, like on you know making quote unquote, uh, well, I'm trying not to use the word content, making making stuff on the internet, because I I think the word content is actually evil, uh, and we need to fight back <laughs> against the forces that have uh, uh, you know, uh, foisted that word on us. Um, yeah, now I'm finally gonna discover the secret of the red key area, <laughs> finally. Yeah, it, oh, I like 18 minutes before the end of the map, I finally am going to discover the terrible secret that I missed something very obvious. Well, I, I shouldn't say it's very obvious, but I missed something that was like, that I could have easily uh, progressed through. Um, yeah, I still don't know what that, that switch does. It keeps popping up and then I keep hitting it just because it's there. Um, but there's so there's so much of an expectation if you're making like stuff on the internet now that like it has to be edited, it has to be presented in this way. Like the expectations have gone so far up on just what the individual person is doing, and this happened to video games too. I mean, like what people expect of indie games, like the level of polish, a lot of times is just insane now compared to you know what was expected in the 2000s uh, when there wasn't like an idea or label behind it. It theoretically, like when you, especially towards the late 2000s when stuff started becoming successful, like it was one of those things where it's like, oh, I could see myself doing this because it doesn't, it seems to be more about ideas and it seems like something that a, a person could conceivably c achieve if they committed themselves to it. Um, and so I think a lot of people bought into that, but I, I think it's just a general like, uh, microcosm of you know quote unquote content on the internet like um of things that people have made on the internet of just like you know you see youtubers start out doing kind of fun vlogs or things like that uh and then transitioning into this hyper dense edited youtube essay stuff and you know even like things like tiktok have gone through like mini cycles like that where People become more successful, they have more resources, they start paying people to work for them. Or you're just expected, yeah, so here I, I enter through the side and I instantly progress. Oh man, that was like, when I did that, I don't think I knew, I don't think I realized the gravity of what had happened because I'm like, okay, this area must have just been opened up now. Um, but then when I looked back on it on the map, I was like, what the fuck? I do actually like this area a lot. It feels a little bit like, you know, his maps like Acid Jazz or something like that. I think this is like this particular section of this key area um, is probably one of the better sections of this map. Um, but, um, but yeah, like the, the expectations increased so much so it became like this so so the idea of like even in 2015 the idea of like me doing a youtube series where it's just me talking over footage of a game it's like people are probably already not really going to watch that anymore but like especially now it's like if if people look at something and it's not like edited and it doesn't seem to be like you know about something serious or important they're probably not going to watch it because you know there's just so much stuff out there. And, um, you know, the, the, the YouTubers or the, the games that people have made that where they've really committed full time and energy into doing lots of research and intense work and effort are there. Um, so why would you spend your time with this other stuff? Or just, you know, doing like the classic let's play thing of, talking over footage 
And we have Twitch streams now, too, that occupy that role. So it's just another th way in which it feels like the kind of thing that I envision that is like, that feels accessible to do that might still have an impact on somebody is just like not a thing that you can do anymore. It's just been phased out. And people would even question the very existence of it. Um, like, why would you even do something like this? Why would you expect me to watch you talk about something for, for two hours? Uh, that's a bug. This is definitely a bug. Uh, I'm not supposed to fall through that floor there. Um, thankfully, I'd saved right before. Thankfully, in Doom, also, we have no clip. I keep thinking that you need to run over this, like, to the other side. I don't think you actually need to do that. I think what happens here is that each of the diagonal, like, spokes uh, unlock as more as I, you know, as I unlock each area. So, um... But I think I'm trying to, like, shortcut it here, but I don't think there's any real way to do that. It just sends me to the other side. The, like, walls for the switches need to open up, so I need to do that by, like, progressing through the these areas. Um, but, yeah, it just... Uh, it definitely makes me feel like the, the, the world that I... that I bought into doesn't exist... Uh, and then I'm talking to no one. And even the people that I thought we're talking to aren't listening. <laughs> and I don't feel as much of a sense of despair about that as I used to. Because I realized that, like, you know, things come in cycles. Oh, this is the classic perpetually teleporting dude. Um, it's like, it's you know, whenever they have a huge amount of enemies and only one space to occupy for the teleporter, they just continually teleport dudes in and it just becomes an ammo sink. I feel like that's done in so many Doom maps. It's just a, a classic Doom trope. It, it really actually makes me realize, as much as I have like talked about how much these Russian Doom maps feel like they're ma made by outsiders who don't approach things the same way, a lot of them are taking and using pretty common Doom mapping tropes. Um in them so maybe part of that is just uh because that's what work w works well within doom i don't know i don't know if it's a conscious imitation or not but um i will say you know having been part of online communities um before that are creative people often subconsciously imitate each other within whatever community in the stuff that they make uh in order to you know fit into the community in one way or another but yeah like i was lucky enough to get into the whole indie game space um just by a weird series of happenstance uh it didn't feel like something that happened <laughs> that develop naturally or anything like that. It's just that I happen to know somebody from an old online community and I didn't have anything else going on in my life. So I think that that part of that's part of what made me be like, well, okay, I have to speak to these people because <laughs> these people who are going to to the game developers conference, they can't see this stuff. They can't they don't understand it. They're not taking it seriously because it's not right in front of their faces and it's not like there's no you know there's no measurable outcomes for it like you can't um you can't really like measure its impact um and i i have to i have to show them but the thing is like most of those people are just completely disinterested um they're not really that interested in understanding those things because the whole reason they're in the world that they're in is partially <laughs> I like how it just like when you die like that it just insta respawns you without even doing the death animation um uh they're, they're, the, the whole reason they're in the space that they're in is partly because they don't want to be in these spaces like they kind of view themselves as like you know occupying the real world and you know what i'm saying sounds mean but it's true like a lot of those people don't understand 
a lot of what exists in these worlds of modding and stuff. And of course, like there are plenty of people in the, the industry that take this stuff seriously and, and all that kind of stuff. But I'm talking about a lot of the people who go to GDC who are like considered thought leaders and all that kind of stuff are not necessarily taking that stuff seriously. But I think over time, what I've realized is like, you know, a lot of that stuff is kind of fake. Um, but, you know, having access to a space and like having people know your name and engage with your work is not fake. So I guess that's why I felt like I, I needed to keep talking about this stuff to those people. But, you know, as is the case with most of those things, those people are not the people who are really listening. <laughs> Uh, it was a lot of other people, but not those people. And, you know, over time, I've realized, like, okay, fuck those people. You know, they, they, either they're going to listen or not, you know. Um, but it does mean it's like, if you bought into the idea of, like, like being part of an institution or, like, some kind of institutional success, like, at some level... I think in games, it's really like apparent the contrast between what most of the world of games is and what like actually what going to like a GDC or an industry event is. As in like most people don't go to GDC or industry events in general who work in the game industry. And I, I think that's probably true of a lot of creative industries. It's certainly true of like, you know, most musicians are not fucking going to the Grammys or you know, or even smaller, like, awards things. They're not involved with the, you know, the ma machinations of, of the record industry or whatever, unless they're the big artists. And, but that doesn't make, you know, but the influence that people have in those spaces is still very real, as much as it might be diminished in a lot of ways. Um... And, like, it feels very strange that I was able to access it at all. So I do feel like I keep having to try and make my case to, like, those people, um, regardless of whether it's a good idea or not, just because of the mere fact that, like, um, it's like <laughs> they're going to see it one way or another, you know? I don't know. And, like... If that instant, if that institutional space is used for anything at all, it should be used for, you know, celebrating a lot of fucking free labor <laughs> that people are doing, uh, that does not get celebrated in any other way. It certainly doesn't make a lot of money. Doesn't have people like wanting to, you know, be next to it. <laughs> wanting to hang out around the cool kids because, you know, they've made a lot of money. It doesn't have it doesn't have Snoop Dogg going over to Notch's house, you know. Um so and and I'm sure there are several people who are in that space who agree with me, but those people are often uh removed from positions of power. <laughs> or remove themselves. Oh, here's another slowly approaching arch file. Wow, that the sense of dread that you get from those slowly approaching arch files is really palpable. I like it in any boom set where they do a, a conveyor belt thing that spits you out to a previous area. Like like they do here. It it feels nice. It feels momentous. And just this one arch file coming up on you is like is perfect. I take this guy out. Yeah. Get get wrecked. Okay. So we're close to the end here. There's one final area. I'm just <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to wa I'm waving bye-bye to those guys. I don't care if they hit me. They're they're all the negative thoughts, you know, that I've had about this series or doing these videos or whatever. All all the all the sort of negative feelings. I'm leaving them behind. Screw you guys. I'm going home. You can't, you can't hurt me. I, I might be moving as <laughs> slow as molasses, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna take me down. I there's nothing more, there's nothing more pleasurable to me than a feeling of like exiting a level while guys are trying to 
try to take you down and approach you and you're just like giving them a finger on the way out. I know some people are like, oh, I got to 100% it, but no, fuck that. There's nothing more fun than, than, than giving guys the finger on the way out. <laughs> Uh, it's like it's like if you're having a bad dream uh, and you're like choosing when to end it like you know in nightmares sometimes where you're like uh, I figured out a way to end this nightmare so I'm just gonna do it so screw you I'm not seeing this anymore I'm not dealing with this anymore uh, we have one less um, uh, cyber demon here I'm not sure if I have to actually hit these switches or not, but I'm just doing... I love the, the little cars. This reminds me of some of the stuff that's done in uh, fucking Lost... Um, with Lost Civilization. Which is... Uh, honestly, Lost Civilization feels pretty similar to Voyager in a lot of ways in terms of how extensive it is. I'd say the levels are easier and more approachable than Voyager. Um, but... It's a similar, like, if you've ever played Lost Civilization, it's a similar, like, scale of sad. It's less accessible and more uh, intense, but uh, a similar kind of sensibility in some ways. Um, yeah. So, you know, what is Doom if not uh, us giving the finger to all of our d personal demons on the way out and just saying, screw you, I got to the exit. That's really what Doom is about. It really captures that feeling. It helps us, it helps us cope. I get to explode this mine up here too. Uh, just such a great little added touch to the, to the end of this map. And you know, like I, I certainly feel okay about doing this whole series. Um, because it's just something like pl there are plenty of YouTubers who are way more successful who do videos about Doom maps who are much more, you know, ingrained in the community and that's fine, but I'm glad that I did something that is kind of not, there's not quite anything else like on this subject. So at the end of the day, that's all that you can feel proud of and, and, you know, I think it is time to move on, but not in a bad way. So I have a couple more videos that I'm going to do for Doom Mixtape, but um, consider this like the penultimate video in some ways or the climactic moment. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this series. Please check out Voyager. I love this music. I'll link you the current version of the set and like the current versions of some of the levels that are not in this particular build. Uh, so that you can have it. Like, I think on my alt article, there was a link to Voyager, but it's the wrong... It, it, the, that link is no longer up. It was, like, to a Facebook group or something. Um, so, yeah, I am planning on doing some videos in the future starting next year, maybe edited videos about games, something in the vein maybe of, like, Ross's Game Dungeon of, like, a little bit more obscure games. I'm just going to test that out, try a few videos, and see if I really want to do that. So look for those next year. We'll see how that goes. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to go. But uh, ex expect another couple Doom videos. I would stream on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash E-L-L-A-G-O-R-O, from time to time. So check that out. And I hope you all have a wonderful fall. And yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>